Thank you for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. Martin Ritt was one of Hollywood's greatest humanist directors. He was a filmmaker of great socially conscious works, but they rarely, if ever, felt didactic or preachy. In this conversation, we speak with biographer Gabriel Miller, author of The Films of Martin Ritt, Fanfare for the Common Man. We discuss Ritt's values as a filmmaker and his string of unforgettable movies, including HUD, The Molly Maguires, Norma Ray, The Front, The Great White Hope, and Murphy's Romance. Please note that this interview was conducted in 2019 for our new podcast series, Movie Geek Yearbook. Find out more by visiting moviegeekyearbook.com. Uh, why Martin Ritt? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I've had a predilection. Uh, my my career has been, um, uh, or my publishing career has mostly de- dealt with sort of writers and filmmakers who were outside the mainstream, uh, who were mm-hmm. not all that well known by uh, the critical establishment. Uh, my first book was on a uh, to me, a wonderful uh, novelist named Daniel Fuchs, who also won the Oscar for uh, his screenplay for Love Me or Leave Me. Mm. <clears throat> to the Eastern establishment, he was sort of persona non grata because he left his career as a writer after three novels and went to Hollywood and became uh, a screenwriter. Uh, but he, but he's a terrific writer, and uh, he's been kept alive over over the years, uh, having his books reprinted and advocated by you know fairly prominent writers. Uh, but he's still fairly, you know, he's still not not very well known. And um, the writ material uh, was m- more closely related to my work on the playwright Clifford Odets. Uh, who Ritt was very friendly with. Um, Ritt had a uh, a very close relationship with Odets, even though Odets informed uh, to the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, Ritt had cut himself off from all the people he knew who did that, uh, especially Elia Kazan, who he was close to in, in his youth. But for some reason, uh, he stayed close with Clifford Odets. Uh, Ritt's wife, who was more politically radical than uh, than he was, would not have Odets over to the house, but uh, Ritt would meet Odets for dinner at a restaurant on a fairly regular basis. Ritt's wife mm-hmm. said she felt that uh, Martin Ritt thought Odets was a little crazy and couldn't be held all that accountable for what he did. But Odets remained close, to, but Ritt remained close to Odets. And I love Odets, and I've always um, leaned toward sort of left leaning um, artists who came of age in the 1930s uh, who were mm-hmm. also Jewish. Uh, who, uh, you know, forged a career that combined a kind of political radicalism or political liberalism uh, with their careers uh, and were humanists and idealists. And I think uh, Odets was a great humanist and an idealist and never lost that humanism and idealism. I like to think that Ritt... um, recognized that in Odets as well. And Ritt was the same way. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, so, so... Uh, well, it's at, interesting, though, because because Ritt has... Uh, Ritt, uh, throughout his career, directed a number of high-profile films that people still recall and revisit today, but he remained under the radar as... as uh, 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 did he not fit into the kind of the auteur realm of cinema at that time? Well, um, uh, Ritt did not encourage uh, the uh, auteur theory to be applied to him. I mean, even during the height of the auteur theory, uh, when I was sort of coming of age as as a film goer in the 60s and, and in the 70s, Ritt never encouraged. Uh, and the 60s, 
you know, as I point out in my book, in my opinion, was Ritz's high point uh, as a movie maker. I think he made a, a sort of an, an unbroken series of, of great films in the 1960s, which re-examined basic American genres. But Ritz was a great believer in collaboration. Uh, I think he got that from his work with Odette's, going back to Odette's, and the group theater, which emphasized community, uh, collaboration, uh, the importance of the group uh, in creating uh, works of art uh, that, uh, you know, the group theater never advertised a star uh, on the marquee of their productions, even though they were a Broadway company. Uh, it was always the group theater presents whatever play was going on. And Ritt grew up in the group theater. Uh, and I don't think Ritt ever lost his feeling for the group theater. And he remained close with members of the group theater all his life. Uh, Harold Klurman, Robert Lewis, Clifford Odets, uh people like that. And Ritt, Ritt believed in community uh, his his movies emphasize that. Uh, his movies damn characters who veer away from the community and value their own selfish mm-hmm. needs above those of the community. And Ritt did not like the auteur theory because I believe he um, he uh, did not want to break, uh, did not want to emphasize himself at the expense of the writers. Uh, the cinematographers, the art directors, the actors. And so you'll never see Martin Ritt, a Martin Ritt film uh, in any of his movies. His name is not above the title. Though I think at a certain point of his career he could have insisted on that and gotten it, uh, but he don't, I don't think he ever insisted on it, and I don't think he ever wanted it. So I think to a certain degree he was under the radar by choice, um, yeah, and it's interesting how you bring up the, the the repeated collaborations he enjoyed throughout his career. I think I read an interview with him, and it might have been from your book, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something to the effect of, you know, I'm not a director of visual flair, uh, flair like the visual gymnastics that define yeah. a, a lot of modern movies, and yet he worked with the greatest cinematographers and people like James Wong Howe and John Alonzo, uh, just amazing craftsmen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gritt, uh, Ritt was not uh, a great stylist, uh, I think. Uh, Walter Bernstein, who I interviewed um, a couple of times, and who was one of Ritt's favorite collaborators and one of his closest friends, uh, said that Ritt turned integrity into a style. And I think that's mm. a nice, uh, nice way to put it. Ritt never drew attention uh, to his style. Uh, he was more interested in the story, and he was more interested in developing his characters. Uh, and those took precedent over his using showy cinematic methods. <clears throat> Though I think there are occasions when he shows that he could do those things, uh, especially the glorious beginning of the Molly Maguires, if, 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 he want, if he wanted to do that. Yeah, the Molly Maguires is, is a kind of a different project for him. It feels, I mean, his movies have always thematically been ambitious, but this one seemed production-wise to be, to be a bit of a, a, a more uh, ambitious film for him. Uh, I think so. I think I think you made a, I think you make a good point. Uh, I never really thought of it much that way. That might have been um, as a result of Robert Evans taking an interest in it and bringing his flair for production values uh, to the movie. Uh, but the movie still is. Uh, it does look a little bigger and a little richer than some of his other movies, especially uh, his movies of the, you know, being a movie of that straddles the 60s and, and, and into 1970. But his, um, yeah, I would, say, I would say you're right about that. But thematically, it's in line with the rest of his movies. Yeah, and let's talk about those themes real quick, because 
the, the, the thread that ties all of his films together is this social consciousness. And I'm curious what from his background uh, was it that developed his sense of social awareness? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> his um, his parents were um, immigrants, uh, and he grew up with uh, an immigrant's feel for and sensitivity to being sort of an outsider. Uh, and um, you know, he grew up in a New York where um, immigrant groups. Um, split up into gangs and, you know, fought each other uh, for gang-like uh, turf. Uh, Rip uh, was an accomplished boxer. Uh, he actually taught Luther Adler how to box for Clifford Odets's Golden Boy, which was one of the big hits of the, of the group theater. And Rip was a good athlete. Uh, he went to Elon College on a football scholarship. Um, though he never finished Elon College, though they gave him a uh, an honorary degree later in his life, and they still brag about him as being um, their most distinguished alum. So that uh, growing up, uh, coming of age in the group theater and the federal theater project, which were very left-leaning, some would say communist-leaning um, uh, theater groups, uh, he was involved with those those theater groups, and uh, and Ritt was briefly uh, a member of the of the communist of the communist party, um, and um, I think being blacklisted uh, radicalized him uh, because uh, the process was so irrational. Um, an ad a television advertiser who owned uh, a series uh, a, a variety of grocery stores in the Syracuse area if I remember correctly uh, named him as a communist sympathizer and that was enough for him to lose his standing in um, the television community uh, Ritt was essentially blacklisted from TV he wasn't really a big movie director uh, movie director at the time and the absurd nature of that I mean Ritt was always Ritt's films even though they're political are always very complex uh, because his characters are not black and white figures they're not political spokespeople who um uh, who are persecuted for their political beliefs, and it's just, uh, you know, uh, a line drawn between the good guys and, and the bad guys. Uh, the Woody Allen character in the front is a fairly amoral mm -hmm. character, uh, and he's not all that sympathetic at the beginning of the, of the movie. Uh, uh, and Rip is always uh, very conscious of the contradictions and uh, in human in human nature, the Molly Maguires uh, that we mentioned a few minutes ago, McParlin, who's the informer in the Molly Maguires, is presented as a fairly attractive character uh, for mo for much of the film. Uh, he's handsome, he's charismatic, uh, he's charming. Uh, he even comes, even though he's there to spy on the Molly Maguires, uh, he begins to sympathize with them. Uh, during the the course of the film, and at the end, he's very very conflicted on what he wants to do, on what he has to do. And even though he does it, uh, the audience develops a certain amount of sympathy for him. And I think the ending of that movie is uh, very very brutal uh, in its treatment mm -hmm. of McParlane and its treatment of Keo, uh, the the head of the Molly Maguires. And the audience did not know what to make of it. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that the uh, the film did not do well. Uh, Ritt was always uh, very, very sad about the fate of the Molly Maguires because I think he felt closer to that film than uh, any of his others. Uh, it was too full of shades of gray to be a successful commercial uh, project. So I think Ritt was fairly, for an idealist, for a man who's usually seen as an idealist, uh, was very... Just, I wouldn't say cynical, but he was very realistic about human nature, 
uh, and didn't shy away from showing the seedier side or the darker side of of human nature, either in the Molly Maguires, which is a very pro-union movie, or The Front, which is obviously uh, an anti-blacklist movie. But I was going to um, ask you about that because you, you brought up a great point about the Richard Harris character in, in Molly Maguires and how, yeah, he's he, he's a traitor, and yet you're not completely um, uh, apathetic to him. And I, I guess it's there even earlier in Mr. Ritt's career in a movie like HUD that he directed, where Paul Newman is a bit of a bastard in that movie, and yet you, you recognize the the currents of desperation underneath that make him uh, uh, kind of empathetic. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Hud is, a, uh, Hud is a, a great example. Ritt, Ritt was shocked at the audience reaction to Hud <clears throat> because he said he wanted to portray Hud as like Richard III. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, he... Um, the audience uh, was completely taken in, of course, by Paul Newman uh, and Paul Newman's persona and the audience's adoration of Paul Newman uh, made them sympathize with him, despite the fact that his character was awful. But I think mm. Ritt shows, I think one of the things that comes out in HUD is that the Melvin Douglas character is too self-righteous. And he's so self-righteous that he does not know how to deal with all of the elements that are coming up against him and force and pushing him away from effectively operating his ranch. Uh, he's so morally correct uh, that I think the audience sometimes pulls away from him. And he brings his failure down on his own head. And even though HUD is basically an awful person, he has a drive and a vitality and a verve, almost like McParlin, where you feel that even though HUD is going to take over, will take over the ranch uh, at the end, uh, and run it in an amoral way. I mean, the implication is that he will sell oil rights uh, to the oil producers, uh, which Red, of course, is totally against. Uh, but he will do that, and he will make money uh, for the ranch and pull the ranch out of the financial doldrums that it's in. So he has a certain kind of integrity that goes not integrity, he has a certain kind of vitality which goes with his amorality. He has mm. the drive of someone who knows how to operate in the world that he's a part of, which Ritt considers a fallen world, but Hud knows how to operate within that world. He's sort of like, and I think I write about this in the book, though I'm so far removed from it that I don't remember very well anymore, uh, I think I talk about the John Wayne character in, in Red River. I mean, the John Wayne character is also amoral. Uh, begin, at the beginning of the movie, he shoots down uh, one of the uh, Mexican representatives of the owner of the land that he's squatting on and that he is going to take over. Uh, and But I think there's a certain amount of admiration for that pioneering spirit, that spirit of a businessman and it's someone who is going to has the foresight to pull almost single-handedly an empire out of nothing uh, mm. and HUD while he inherits the land and he er inherits the land in a, in, a, in a kind of terrible way is going to is going to become a part of the world that he was born into and he will thrive in the amoral world that he's born into. I mean, Ritt considers the, you know, the, the post-industrial world that he's making movies about to be amoral. You see it, uh, you see it the same way in Ombre. Ombre is conflicted between his white American identity and his Indian identity, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you, the two parts of Hud are. Rich shows HUD up against his 
father. You see those two aspects of an identity, uh, and it's being mediated by Lon, the uh, the nephew, who is sort of torn between idolizing Hud and being close to his uncle. Uh, in Ombre, you get Russell, who carries both of those aspects within himself: the white, the white man, and the Indian. And he has to, he has to get along with the white men in order to get them, in order to get through this trudge through this desert area to get the people he's responsible for, uh, you know, through and to and to save them. Much against much against what he really wants to do. Uh, and you get that in the Brotherhood, too. You have the Kirk Douglas character uh, going up against uh, his brother. Uh, his brother represents the new mafia, the business-like mafia, the corporation, the board. Uh, and the Kirk Douglas character is the old mafia who does things his way. And the interesting thing is, just like in The Godfather, which the Brotherhood anticipates, the Kirk Douglas character, even though he's a mafia chieftain and he makes his living in amoral ways, becomes a sympathetic character because he's connected with the old world and he's effectively uh, put up against his brother who is amoral and represents mm. this nameless, anonymous corporate group and of course uh, Kirk Douglas's brother in the Brotherhood kills his own brother which is the worst violation of any character in any of Ritz films. McParlin uh, informs against Kehoe um, Hud brings on his father's death but he doesn't actively kill him, his behavior, you know, causes Homer Bannon to, you know, to get a, to get a heart attack. Uh, and, uh, but in, in the Brotherhood, which is, and in Aubrey, um, Aubrey, sac uh, Russell sacrifices himself, not intentionally, but almost intentionally, uh, to save the group and is destroyed by these white, uh, bandits, including a Mexican bandit. Uh, but, uh, you know, but in the Brotherhood, one brother actually kills another brother. Uh, and he's not only a brother, but since his brother raises him after their parents died, he's like a combination brother-father figure. And he kills him. He kills him for the corporate group that asks him to do it. So he's the greatest of Ritz' damned sinners. He's worse than HUD. Uh, he's worse than McParlin. He's worse than the House on American Activities Committee. Uh, he's a he's a horrible, horrible, damnable person. Well, it's interesting because we're talking about such um, complicated the shades of gray, like you mentioned, uh, and so that didn't follow the trends of really most times in film history. I mean, he wasn't a trendy filmmaker, so how did he manage to function with the material that he was naturally attracted to within the studio system? Uh, he functioned because he, uh, I think, uh, he, uh, producers sort of liked him. Uh, uh, his, his movies didn't cost very much. Uh, he brought his movies in on time. Uh, he, uh, he worked well, uh, he worked well within the system. And I think he liked the security of the system. Uh, he didn't really want to break away that much from the system. Walter Bernstein wanted him to be more of an independent filmmaker. But I think Rip, Rip liked secretly deep down the security that working for the studio gave him rather than, uh, taking the kind of financial risks that being out on his own would. Uh, but his films never really cost much, uh, mm. and uh, they made money. You know, Some of them didn't, but most of them, most of them did. And he had good taste. Uh, his, uh, uh, his films always got good reviews, uh, or almost always got good reviews. Actors loved to work with him. 
uh, and uh, his actors got multiple Oscar nominations. So he was well regarded uh, in the system, uh, and yeah. uh, he worked well. He worked well within the system. He was trustworthy. Uh, he brought the films in. He wasn't uh, a prima donna, uh, and uh, um, you know his films basically did, for the most part, most of them did very, not very very well, not by blockbuster standards, but they made money. And as long as they yeah. made money, and he didn't make that many movies really. Well, the, out of the movies that he made, uh, Injustice is certainly an overriding theme in. Injustice in various forms, including racial injustice. Um, and we just booked an interview with Jane Alexander to be a part of this series. Oh, okay. Um, and so the Great White Hope is is going to be of 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 enormous interest to us, and as well as the other films that he made dealing with racial injustice. Tell, tell me about his delvings into that theme. That you take well, I think his great film about racial injustice and I think one of uh, I think it's a great film period is Sounder uh, Sounder mm. is a great looking film uh, you know you, you see how well Rit could film um, movies outdoors with you know a bigger kind of spatial uh, canvas uh, you know in, in that film while also being very intimate, uh, his uh, the film focuses on the family, uh, and the film is extremely realistic. It's very cinematic, while at the same time being uh, almost naturalistic and documentary-looking in certain ways. Uh, Ritt was great at getting down the details of um, the way people lived. Uh, especially the way poorer people or working class people lived. Uh, Sounders and he, re he really went in there. He, he really went in there, didn't he? He didn't shoot on sound stages. He shot in real no, location. No, no, he, sa he shot on location. He liked to shoot on location. Uh, and it's a mm -hmm. very, very empathetic portrait of African American life with a very uh, upbeat ending. Uh, it moves away from. Uh, his movies in the 60s, which were very, very dark uh, and uh, very, very bleak. HUD is bleak. Ombre is bleak. The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, The Molly Maguires, um, and, uh, are all, and The Brotherhood are all extremely bleak films. Uh, most of them are genre films. And then he sort of moves away when he makes Sounder into a much more open looking movie it's as if he's almost exploring a, ro a world rather than creating one and he um uh he is very hard-nosed at looking at the the racism in american society and the degraded way that these people uh, live and are forced to conduct their lives but at the same way he's advocating um education and the dedication of the family, the love of the family for each other, uh, the mm. empathy they have for education and moving ahead uh, in life pulls the movie into a forward-looking and optimistic direction, which is not true of The Great White Hope. The Great White Hope sort of straddles the movies of the 60s and the 70s, even though it was uh, released in 1970, it, it has more of a uh, of a 60s of a 60s look. I don't think Ritt was very good at transferring uh, stage plays to the screen. Uh, he never did it well. The outrage is is a transfer of, of a stage play to the screen. Nuts is a transfer uh, from a stage play to the screen, and so is the Great White Hope. I mean, it's interesting. I think it was in his interview with the American Film Institute that Ritt said that he did not like transferring um, plays to the screen. He didn't think movies did well with stage plays. I don't think Ritt really knew how to do it uh, very well. Um, yeah. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and and the Great White Hope looks like a play. Uh, it does not look like a movie. And I'm not a great fan of the Great White Hope as a play, anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, it I, also... I did. I re I reread the uh, New York Times review of the film, and the first sentence was, you know, this Great White Hope wasn't much of a play to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So someone so agrees. You're not alone. I mean, the play yeah. won the Pulitzer Prize and the Drama Critics Award and the Tony Award. So uh, I mean, it was it, you know it was a highly regarded play. I saw it myself when I was in college, uh, and I wasn't bowled over by it. I mean, one of the great virtues of the movie is that it 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 put it allows us to revisit James Earl Jones's towering performance uh mm-hmm. that he, and uh, that he transfers from the play and Jane Alexander's uh too uh and uh but it lo- it's 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 a very confined looking movie uh it does not look real um and um it looks very very stagey uh it's very agit proppy uh mm-hmm. um uh the you know it's it's something that writ usually avoids and drawing distinctions between the good guys and the bad guys the white the white boxing promoters are venal awful people uh and uh and jack johnson is presented almost as a uh you know as a heroic uh, a heroic figure uh, especially, though again, Ritt mitigates that somewhat, and that's due to the play too, not only to him, by the way he treats the the Jane Alexander character, his wife. He treats her, yeah. he doesn't treat her well, uh, and the audience withdraws a little from him. Uh, but, you know, he's still presented as a kind of heroic, heroic figure. Uh, I think Ritt was ambivalent about taking on the great white hope and talked himself into into it, you know, after the movie yeah. was finished. So. The um and then and then on the outside of racial injustice he also dealt with labor issues related to labor unions uh a couple of times and, and uh, I'm thinking about something like his movie Norma Ray, which was yeah. an enormous enormous success. And I'm wondering did any of these films like Norma Ray did they did they succeed in in, in pushing the discussion of these issues? Uh, yes, I think Norma Ray uh, succeeded in pushing the discussion of the issues. Uh, the Molly Maguires was also about labor unionism and the the exploitation of of workers, uh, and uh, to some extent, it sort of touched on uh, in Ritz's first movie, Edge of the City. Uh, but uh, but Norma Ray is an out and out pro. Uh, labor movie, uh, labor movie, and an out and out pro union movie. Uh, but again, it's done through uh, the education of Norma Ray uh, and mm. um, her evolution as uh, you know a, uh, a southern woman who is just trying to make en- ends meet. Uh, and doesn't really think very seriously about social issues or anything more than, uh, you know, dealing with her family and trying to find a love life for herself. Uh, And then she evolves into someone who becomes a reader of Dylan Thomas and other kinds of uh, serious literature and uh, a union activist. And um, Ron Liebman's performance, I think, is always very undervalued because yes. um, Sally Field gets all the kudos as as she should. She gives a uh, she gives a great uh, performance, and it's a testament to the way Ritt, uh, how great Ritt was with actors. You know that he transformed her really into a serious actress, and she would she would say the same thing. Uh, and she gives a great performance, and it turned around her her movie career. So she creates yeah. a very empathetic character, uh, and I think her character and the the character of Ruben Wachowski are again at the center of the movie. Uh, their characters carry the movie, and the politics of the movie is swept along is swept along with it. 
makes the environment feel so authentic. Yeah, the environment, uh, it's like Sounder, the working class environment, the house, uh, the Norma Ray's parents' house, uh, the house she shares with the Beau Bridges character after uh, after they get married, uh, the factory, um, uh, the factory atmosphere, and, you know, Rip, the outdoors of the film, the the, mm. the scenes where uh, Norma Ray and uh, and Ruben are swimming in a creek. Everything looks like it's a part of a world that is actually there, that's recognizable. There's nothing Hollywood looking about Norma Ray. There's nothing Hollywood looking about Sounder. There's nothing Hollywood looking about Stanley and Iris. They're very, very gritty, working class, realistic, naturalistic movies. Yeah, and I, I love that you pointed out Ron Liebman's performance in the movie, too, because I do think that he's undervalued. And I remember years ago watching him in the Lumet film, uh, Night Falls on Manhattan. Yeah. And uh, it was like he gave that movie a shot of adrenaline. I, I'm surprised he didn't bite the camera lens. <laughs> he, was, he was so alive. Yeah, he's a very charismatic movie. actor. I saw him in the original production, too, of... Uh... Uh, Angels in America, where he played Roy Cohen. Oh. Uh, he's he was a gr he was a really great actor. Uh, he never had the career, uh, in my mind, that he should have had. Yeah, can I ask you about one other movie? And it might not be on the thematic level of these others that we're discussing. But as a as a kid, I was born in '73, and I always loved uh, Murphy's Romance. I always got oh, such God bless a, you. A delightful, that, perfectly entertaining movie. I love that movie too. I think uh, uh, again, Sally Field is wonderful in it. I think she had a hand in uh, in producing it. Uh, again, it's a beautifully observed movie. Uh, the world comes alive. It's very realistic to its working class environment. Uh, the the the, the drugstore that James Garner. Uh, owns looks just like a drugstore uh, is supposed to look, uh, and I'm sure you know it was filmed at an actual drugstore. Even the way he makes an ice cream sundae in the movie, everything looks authentic. Uh, her house, the way Rich shows her buying this house and cleaning it up and renovating it uh, and making it making it look good. Um, Everything and and the relationship between the characters is so real and so moving. And again, the way the characters are three dimensional, and you see the way their romance blossoms and grows. It's mm -hmm. it's it's wonderful. You know, I I think it's yeah, a it, wonderful movie. I'm so glad, it, it, and it does feel very lived in and and effortless. Um, yeah. With that, be, with that being said, I, my last question for you: When you, when someone like Martin Ritt is dealing with all of these themes, many of them very uh, profound themes, did he? How did he keep from veering into the realm of preachiness, or or did, was he always successful at that? I'm trying to think if there was any movie uh, that I think was preachy. I think The Great White Hope was preachy. Um, mm. I think to a certain degree, Conrack was preachy. Um, it has a lot of more um, melodramatic and overstated sequences in it. Uh, the scene where uh, Con uh, Conroy, um, who the kids call Conrack, uh, after he's fired and he's leaving the island and the children watch him, uh, uh, you know, as the po boat that's carrying him to the mainland uh, moves away from the island and you have um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony playing in the background. Uh, that's very heavy-handed. You know, it's yeah. very heavy-handed for Ritt. Uh, like the Great White Hope is is heavy handed. His two film, his three movies that deal with racial injustice, I think, except for Sounder, uh, the Great White Hope and 
Conrack are both on the heavy-handed side. You know, though what he's what he's saying is 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 wonderful, and what he's saying is very very important. Uh, I think he lets the message overwhelm the medium, uh, which he does not do, and uh, which he does not do in Sounder. Uh, but I think Ritt was always, I think, like Clifford Odets, uh, always enough of um, a realist uh, and someone who thought deeply about human nature to keep his movies on an even keel and to make them extremely in- intelligent and to make the characters very, very complicated. I think to some extent uh, that's also due to the writing. Um, when Ritt was dealing with great writers like Irving Frank and uh, uh, Harriet Frank and Irving Ravitch and Walter Bernstein, his movies tended to be much better uh, than... Yeah. The, not, the movies written by more pedestrian writers. 